my name is Justin Whitty. I am the gallery director of the Cleve Carney Art Gallery. And I want to welcome you to the first lecture in the spring semester from the COD Visiting Artist Series, which is a collaboration between the gallery and the visual arts program. Uh, today we are fortunate enough to have Fahim Majid to come talk to us about his practice. Fahim Majid describes himself as a builder. This may at first seem odd, but it makes more sense when you consider that a builder is just someone who constructs, it's not just someone who constructs objects, but someone who can see the potential for objects, for spaces or communities that do not yet exist, and then is able to find the resources to create them. Fahim Majid works with the material, the people, and the spaces within his community and that of the greater Chicago area to create artworks, moments of dialogue, communication, and even celebration. He is a builder. Fahim Majid received his BFA from Howard University, his MFA from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Go Flames. <laughs> he is the former director and curator of the Southside Community Arts Center. He has been an artist in residence at the University of Chicago Arts and Public Life Initiative at MANA Contemporary and the Chicago Department of Public Affairs and Special Events. He has exhibited his work extensively, including a 2015 exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Fahim also serves as co-director of the Floating Museum that recently floated a museum on a, mar a barge down the Chicago River, docking it both at the Riverwalk and at Navy Pier. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Fahim Majid. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out. And um, do I do I need both of these, or maybe not? Um, I like to pace a little bit when I when I talk. So, um, but thank you for coming out. Um, this is a real exciting moment, actually. Um, uh, uh, many of you, this is uh, are seeing this new body of work. This is the first time this new body of work is actually being shown um, in public, and it's something I'm really excited about and been working on for the past year. So um, let's get to it. Um, I'm a welder by training. Um, it's important uh, uh, to show this image and understand. Um, I studied at Howard University, and I was the only uh, sculpture major in the whole university. Um, didn't really have a program. They had a, uh, an arts program. They had a lot of painters. But I was a welder um, because I sucked at painting. Um, I, went, I went for painting and realized that I was no good at it. Um, uh, so I almost lost the faith. And then I saw guys with blow torches. Um, and I was like, fire. So I fell in love with that. But really what it is, I, I fell in love with the assemblage process. You can kind of see uh, um, this is actually my first studio when I first came to Chicago after uh, graduating. But on the floor there, you can kind of see the cutoff pieces. So a little side story. Um, uh, 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 so this is just some of that work, right? right? So this is my earlier work. This is one of the first pieces I did. It's still cowboy, very representational, sharecropper. But you can see how, um, you know, and being the only sculpture major, there was no budget. So I had to learn how to get materials, how to use outdated equipment, um, which I didn't know, I thought I had it great, but then when I went and started teaching at School of the Art Institute, I realized, oh man, we didn't have anything. Um, but then I realized that because not having anything and making something out of nothing, I was able to quickly transition into a studio practice. And I, know, I knew, I already did that because I, I learned that. So um, as great as the School of the Art Institute was, I often would tell my students that you're really screwed because when you leave here, you're not gonna have any of this. And you're not gonna know how to actually make when you don't have money or access to resources. So these are all parts from demolished buildings, railroad ties, found material, and then also just having to navigate how to get to these materials, you know, uh, and make these networks to get those things. So building that relationship with construction companies. And you can start to see a difference in the work. Uh, from the early work, like the Steel Cowboy, those is very much about a picture that was inspiring and then I start moving my work into uh, restraints and, 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 and um, thinking about content, right? So the pieces you see with the chairs are really 
uh, about a time when I went back to Minnesota where uh, my mother was and took care of her in her final years. So this is the body of work. Uh, she passed from ovarian cancer. And this is the body of work. This is the first time that I was able to take something that uh, wasn't not just technically sound, but also started, tapped into other ideas like that were more personal. So the chair becomes a representation of her, and the figures become me. And this is the body of work that actually brought me to Chicago. This is what started. Uh, I was a full-time artist pretty much immediately when I moved to Chicago in 2003. And it, that work kind of continues. So found materials. Now all this to say that I don't do this anymore, but I think it's important. Um, I don't make a lot of this right now. So I stepped away from this more representational work um, in, in kind of like maybe like a five year, six year long kind of exploration. And I think I, I put these in here mostly for the students, right, to understand evolution. So Purdue North Central, a little while ago. This was the last kind of really big piece for the sake of being big uh, that I did. I used to want to be Richard Hunt. And if you ever go down to Lakeshore Drive and see those really massive sculptures, I, I, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to make really big things. And then I started thinking maybe a little differently about my legacy. And maybe my legacy wasn't to make big things that lived well beyond uh, and slowly rusted away and decayed, but maybe my legacy is about people. So Justin did such a great job in introducing, thinking about uh, me as a builder. And uh, build, building can be both literal, like building forms and objects, but also building relationships, building communities. And when I came to Chicago, um, I came to Chicago for love. I think I told some of you guys this, but followed my girlfriend at the time here, who also went to Howard. Uh, she got a job here. I, there wasn't anything holding me in Minnesota anymore. Um, so why not? Let's go on down to Chicago. That doesn't always work out. Sometimes that can be disastrous, uh, but it did work out for us. We got married and had three kids. Um, so it's still working out, so as I don't mess it up. Um, so I came to Chicago, didn't know anyone, uh, and actually making this sculpture uh, I tapped into a whole bunch of painters that uh, were doing shows predominantly on the south side. And I kind of uh, rounded out uh, a lot of their kind of uh, work because I didn't take up wall space. And no one else was making metal because metal's expensive. But here I am making these huge sculptures. So I found this place, South Side Community Art Center in Bronzeville. Uh, and um, some of the artists that I initially met said, we well, don't know anyone, you should go here. This is where you go. It's a space that you use home. You can go there. Just go. And so. Um, that worked out. I mean, the people who told me that were drunk and high at the time. Um, <laughs> so I probably shouldn't have done that, but um, they were a little sketchy. But uh, that ended up, too, to their word, being a really great place. It ended up being my home. It was really my entrance into Chicago. And um, it's important, I said this earlier, that um, I fell in love with this space. I just sat up there, uh, mostly with a lot of older uh, members of the community, people like Margaret Burroughs, who you see sitting down at the bottom, who founded the Savo Museum across the street and was a young person when the place was founded in the late 30s, right? So it's a space of emerging artists. And you look on the walls and you go in and it feels like an old space, right? Because the photos oftentimes are black and white. But you look at the pictures in the spaces, there are young people in those photos. And it, it continues to kind of thrive. It came out of the New Deal. I'm going to give you a little background, why it's important. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was there to open the doors. And it was, um, it was called a WPA Art Center. So people went here to get jobs. If you're a painter, you're broke, you come here, you teach an art class, you make a mural at a post office, right? And the government pays for that. And they help to um, kind of, um, um, uh, they, they pay for some of the renovations. There's a young Margaret Burroughs versus an older Margaret Burroughs, right? So a lot of famous people kind of came through here. Gordon Parks, who was a phenomenal person. Gordon Parks is the first uh, African-American photographer for Time Life magazine and also did the movie Shaft. Anybody know Shaft? Yeah, that's the movie, maybe. Yeah, Samuel Jackson, Shaft, well, even that's a little dated. Um, and Charles White, I mean, just many, Nat King Cole, Gwendolyn Brooks, a lot of young people coming through this space. This is their first exhibition, and there are those beautiful walls. And just a lot of amazing things. I can literally do a whole lecture just on this space. Right? This is it today. Right? It's kind of lush, beautiful walls. It's an interesting concept. The, the design of those walls 
uh, was about mark making, unlike uh, a white gallery, like you look at uh, Cleet Carney, for example, it's, it's a white space, it's a, a space of potential. You come in and then you wipe it clean, it's a brand new canvas. In this space, every artist from since 1930 up to last week has put a hole in that wall. <laughs> and it becomes kind of like this really great didactic timeline where you don't erase the use. The use actually builds on itself. That was a design concept that came from my, one of my architecture students, right? All right, put your, raise your hand, okay. So Bauhaus, right? So um, Chicago New Bauhaus, y'all heard of IIT, right? Mm -hmm. So IIT was down the street and it was founded uh, primarily by uh, uh, founders of the Bauhaus kind of uh, design uh, movement that came from, fled from Nazi Germany. And they were down the street, they came in and renovated the interior and that's the design principle that you will build on it, that the walls themselves become a didactic timeline of use. That was really beautiful. But when I walked in, I was like, it really is kind of moldy in here. It's kind of old. We should put some drywall up. This isn't how the space works. But after sitting and having people tell me to shut up and sit down, right, um, I learned that. Um, I show, when I show this space, it's important, right? So this isn't anything to necessarily do with the show, but in everything to do with the show. I have to talk about my origins a little bit. That's Elizabeth Catlett, um, who was my hero. She was the first graduate, one of the first graduates of my department at Howard University. A phenomenal woman, passed away recently. That's the reception she got when she came in town. She's like a rock star. I show a lot of faces, right? So while I'm thinking about building large monuments, I start thinking about this as a legacy and how the production of artwork can actually tap into more. How making a sculpture can actually support community, right? You know, access, things like access. So it has a phenomenal collection of over 500 works. And in this space, while I was there, I took great pride in the ability of someone from a high school walking in and asking to see a Charles White and be able to walk it out, put it on an easel, or an Africa Cobra work. So this is a big part of who I became, right? Now, I thought, there's some issues. I thought, you know, when I came back, I would volunteer. I asked to be on the board. They said no. Um, they said, we'll put your wife on the board. Uh, we need you to actually think about that gallery that's in disarray. So I started curating. But I didn't go to school for curation. I went to school for metal sculpture. So I had to think about my model of what curation was based on me being that young person walking through the door needing assistance. So everything I did was really thinking about myself and what I need and what would further my career and then shifting the focus off myself onto the artists that I work with and the communities that I was with, right? So some of that is like pushing how we think about art installation, new ideas and spaces, right? Here's some of that collection. And then how to leverage like art like to do some of those things. It's a very interesting space. That's a very sleepy, quiet space. Right? And that's Margaret Burroughs. Uh, another little important, here's your fun uh, historical moment. Anybody heard of the Sabo Museum? Yeah. So the Sabo Museum is the first museum of African American history in the country. And she founded that, kind of uh, by proxy learning it from kind of founding an uh, art center. Um, but she was a school teacher. How many in here are trying to do art ed? Right? Okay. So she was a school teacher and frustrated. She was teaching art and noticed that um, uh, there was a lack of diversity in the curriculum. There were no blacks, there were no Latinos, there were no Russians, you know, there was no there was no diversity, no Brazilian, no African. And she asked for change. She protested. She went to the school board and nothing happened. So she said, screw it, I'm gonna do it myself. So she got people together like us. She asked for some stuff. She put that stuff in her home across the street from the Southside Community Arts Center with her husband and then started bringing her class and her students into her home to teach them and the community into her home to show them. And one day, the story is, um, a, a, a preacher comes up to the house and says, how much does it cost to get in the museum? And she laughs, museum. I don't know, a um, dollar. Says, okay, cool. I'll be right back. 
comes back with two bus loads full of parishioners with dollars. So what that says is she didn't start out to found a museum, and this taps into the work. She started out to educate her community because she saw, saw a need. Then the community said, we need more. We need a museum because we're going to keep calling this a museum. She didn't keep it in her home. She scaled it up based on that need. She saw a need, a thirst from the community, and she was able to scale that up. Right? So Margaret Burroughs was a printmaker, an artist, just like myself. And she shifted her artwork um, in a lot of different ways uh, uh, to be a woodcut printmaker. And the reason she chose that medium was because it's cheap. So I do a lot of my work is, uh, is actually about her work. She didn't really care about signing works and the authenticity. Like she would sign anything. She signed her name. She signed her husband's name. She would sign the men who she taught in Statesville prison's name because they couldn't sign the work. Right? But she did that because people needed that for it to be valuable. But what, what it was more about, every time you met her, she would have a Xerox copy. She'd say, Fahim, especially in her later years, she was like in her 90s, Fahim, go run me off some more Xerox copies and, and bring them down here. And she'd start handing them out. She would go and hand out to every one of you, right? Um, and then ask you what you wanted to be when you grew up, no matter how old you were. Um, and then that would start a conversation. So you knew the thing was valuable, right? But the work was all about access to people. It wasn't about the unique object. Um, I took that. Uh, she never talked about that in the way that I'm talking about it, but spending time with her, I was able to kind of glean that through her practice. Um, a lot of that, my time at the center, actually moved into all my work. So I have to talk about the center because there's so many, it becomes such a complex space and such a sleepy building. Um, whether that's kind of like sneaking works out of the collection. Oh, by the way, I became executive director of the space, if you haven't figured that out. I became executive director of the space when I was in grad school. So I had to sneak out of crits to go do board meetings and sneak back in. <laughs> you're not supposed to have a job when you're in grad school, let alone run a non-for-profit. Um, but the running of the non-for-profit became my practice because it's, I thought naively that I could run that space like Monday and Wednesdays and then become a rock star artist out of my studio because I have my own studio practice Tuesdays and Fridays. And I was gonna get this 70 year institution fixed in like two days and then like Friday or Wednesday could be my day off. <laughs> Quickly I realized that's not how that works. Spaces like this are basically succubuses of your time, resources, money, and emotion. So either I, I came to a crossroads where I had to either figure out if I was going to love that institution, which was a passion, or love my sculpture and my artwork, which was a passion. And when I came to the crossroads, you know what I did? Students, what I do? What do you do when you come to the crossroads? What? Yeah, so pick one. What else? Huh? Yeah. Well, yes and no. You take on more debt and go to grad school. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> and at grad school, I learned about things like institutional critique, right? I began to question why can't the running of an institution, why can't running an institution administration be the art practice? Why can't installing an exhibition be a performance? You know, How can my actions, once again, in making artwork tap into my impulses of, of supporting and pushing my uh, community? So institutional critique is often about critiquing the larger institution. But what I decided to do was critique the smaller institution. My thesis title was Demise of the Southside Community Arts Center. So during the day, I love it. I hold it. And at the end of the day, I try to burn it down and get rid of it. And there's value in that. So I figured out how to attack that place that I loved because I was the prodigal son. Things like sneaking out pieces from the collection because I had a set of keys taking it to UIC, turn around backwards, and not letting people see the artwork. Because really, it's objective. None of them were going to the center. So why should I show them the artwork? Why well, am I going to bring it to you? You need to come to the space. And vice versa, you don't know who the artists are anyway. So it's more helpful to actually look at the stickers on the back. Provenance, but restriction. Understanding that I had an art history that I felt like a person in a space that was a minority when I first went to the university. And then I began to realize everybody in that picture that you saw 
I knew all of them. But no one else in the room did. So maybe I'm not a minority. Maybe I'm the specialist. And I can get to the history in the books, but you can't get to the history not in the books. How can I leverage that? Oh, boy, I started strutting in. When I figured that out, my whole world changed. Right? But also in an action that's challenging the space I was in. Right? It's not about pointing fingers. It's about bringing community in and challenging the community. Who is the community in the Southside Community Arts Center? And why is the center in disarray? Why does no one know about it? Do we care about it? We don't care about it. Let's get rid of it. Let's close that chapter. Maybe build something new. This is my perennial garden piece. This is a piece that was at the MCA. This is that wood. Remember I told you that beautiful story about the holes in the wood? When I left and I stepped down as executive director, um, I wanted to take the wood with me. They wouldn't give me the panels, I asked. So I had to make my own panels. So this is a set of wood panels that I take around with me, and they take different forms. They've been bleachers for William Walker, a William Walker mural. This one is a floating, uh, they've been a table where I took things that were cast off from the basement of the Southside Community Arts Center and made a landscape installation. That's at High Park Arts Center. And Planting, Maintaining a Perennial Garden was one of the first essays I read about the center, a space that doesn't have a written history. It's just a more of a patch quilt of essays and things like that, so. Yeah, so they take different forms. They become sculpture elements in their program. When I stepped away, I began to understand the value of access, the ability to talk about that history and then have someone come in, one of you guys, that falls in love with it and then give you the keys and walk out the door and be like, okay, lock up, don't mess up. Access, trust, right? Give someone their first show, the power of that. Do you know what that means to give an artist their first solo show? That's a big deal. It's a huge deal. I lost that when I stepped away from the center because they took my keys. And I was just like, you should let me have these keys, man, because I know this building inside. I know the plumbing. You know, I know everything. You're going to need me. And they're like, that's true. We probably will, but we're going to need them keys back. <laughs> So kind of going through a thing, uh, Shacks and Shannings in a lot of ways, uh, multiple things. It's a, it comes out of a, a time when I, I wanted to step away from my thoughtful, kind of artsy-fartsy grad school and just wanted to build something with my hands and not think about it too, Bill. That's a whole other presentation. But it does come out of this idea of creating space, right? So I had access to a free space. Didn't have access to money, but I had space. I had space to give. No longer had that. And I began to see how that was an important thing for my practice. So I built shacks and vacant lots, and I invited artists to come in and activate those shacks, and community members to activate those shacks, to vandalize the shacks, to steal from the shacks, to own the shacks, to push against the shacks, to rebel against the shacks, but ultimately to talk about space and why there's a vacant lot in the first place. Floating museum, right? What does it mean to move the Sabo Museum from Washington Park, which is on the south side, to downtown to the museum campus, right? What does it mean to float an institution, right? At first it was literal, and then we began to realize, uh, me and my collaboration, Floyd Museum is a collaboration of different artists with different skill sets. Um, there's other things that could be benefited from that. You know, you move an institution from one side of town to downtown, what happens to its communities that, are, that go to it? What happens to its access to resources, funding, Right? But then also thinking about access. So floating museums is actually a critique on museum practices. You know, museums often have the challenge of connecting uh, with smaller institutions. It's a conversation that comes up all the time. They do it here, right? Like, how, how can we tap into a broader community? I know these two guys think about that all day long, right? That's one of their charges, right? Justin, you know, it's like, how can we bring other communities in, right? But understanding the nature of museums, mu museums have holdings. They have that thing called a collection, right? And they have big infrastructure. And oftentimes, the budget of that thing overwhelms the smaller institutions, like a, a sky art or a project onward. So there's a space in between. And maybe there's a, there's a space to occupy where there's a flattening of connection. That's what we do. We use design and architecture and thoughtful programming and collaboration to think about really ridiculous 
and challenging things. So we know where we want to go, but to get there, we got to work with everybody to make that happen. Sometimes that's the Department of Transportation. Sometimes it's deep case. Sometimes you got to knock on the door of the mayor. But when we get around a table to get this thing accomplished, right? Oh, man, there it is. I was flowing too, right? Kind of. You can do some amazing things. This, this is a 100-foot barge that thought about the Chicago River as a vein that goes to the city. It's an industrial corridor, right? Uh, any, anyone knows when we do our recreation on water, we do it on our lake, not the river. So the river has this huge potential. And we're in a moment where they're trying to think of it for uh, its recreation, right? So they just built the Riverwalk downtown. It was also in Bridgeport. It started in southeast Chicago, which is an amazing space. There is an east side of Chicago. It's not the river. It's not the lake. A lot of people think the east side is the lake. There is an east side, believe it or not. Um, and all these neighborhoods have amazing histories. So by working with the people who do the work in the neighborhoods, also the artists that live around the, the city, artists that don't live around the city, you can start to curate these exchanges that happen. So each one of those crates has been curated or built by an artist or organization. Some of them from students fresh out of UIC, I think it was one of the youngest, or Sky Arts, which is an art program, to Dan Peterman and Popel, who were in Documenta this year, to Colleen Smith, who was at the Art Institute. Uh, yeah, I had a show at the Art Institute, or Amanda Williams, who came and spoke here, I think, last year, also in the Art Institute and the MCA. So, and then flattening that value. You can think about each one of them is just, really valuable in the space they're in, but one isn't more valuable than the other. So, let's unite, right? Let's talk about the show a little bit. How are we doing on time? Okay, so I talked a little about this early. So this is a unique moment, because it actually takes me back into my builder's roots. Um, uh, there was a moment when the programming became a big part of my canvas, uh, it still is. So when I make the thing, I'm also thinking about how it, it talks about space. So even in this work, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, you look at these kind of close-ups, right? They reference painting, the history of painting. You know, Jasper Johns, um, you know, Rothko, you know, <laughs> things that come out of museum spaces and art canon that I would like to have a dialogue with. They're real important to me. But they also reference this material, right? So I talked a little about this earlier, so forgive me if it's repetitive for the students that came back out, but uh, OSB. OSB board is an inexpensive board you can buy from any hardware store. It's made to be inexpensive um, and often used to secure, pro part, uh, sec secure properties in my neighborhood. It's used for construction purposes, too. It's also often a substrate. It's the thing underneath the veneer. So particle board is also, you go to Ikea, and you pull back that veneer, you see particle board underneath. It's not really the thing you want to look at, right? So all those be start to become like metaphors, the thing underneath, right? The thing that isn't valued, right? Um, uh, is used to board up buildings in my neighborhoods, uh, the places that I, I frequent. And I began to see painting as I'm driving, looking at the board up, right? So that's what you see, this is what I see, this is what I see. This is what I see, right? See it as a chrysalis of potential. That's actually a secured property because it's valuable. And when it comes down, there'll be another family in there, another building in there, another business, right? You see the sun kind of beating down on that, changing it from brown to gray to black. You get color variations. But oftentimes you, you don't see that because you just see kind of disenfranchisement or disinvestment. But I see color in my community. And it's a material that I use a lot, especially in my MCA show. Right. So that's the one thing. I'm thinking about the history of painting. But then also thinking about color theory and thinking about history, going back to the Southside Community Arts Center. Here's some more pieces from the collection. These are works by a collective called Afrocobra. Afrocobra comes out of 1968, uh, or, or roughly 1960. I actually 
there's a video that maybe I'll, I'll show. But uh, basically, they came together after doing a project called The Wall of Respect and out of a collective called Obasi. And they came up with um, almost like a theory. Like I talk about color theory, but this is Afrocobra theory. Afrocobra theory is about using really bright colors to draw people in. That's them. And Barbara Jones Hogu is down on the bottom left. But thinking about the colors that the people were wearing in the streets at the time, really bright colors, right? So who's going to see Black Panther? Yeah, I know. I can't wait. But, but if you think about the color schemes in that movie, it's a very similar kind of impulse, these really bright kind of African, Afrocentric colors and the way they're kind of arranged. And using those colors as a way to draw people in, right? Think about audience, right? And then using text, the embedded text, to give a message. So the colors pull them in. The message kind of gets kind of imprinted on the, the brain. And then you leave that. It's about empowerment. It shows powerful images of people, right? And the words aren't necessarily just like words. They're also embedded. They're, they're a key feature to the design of the actual piece itself. They're embedded in the work, right? So there's these set of rules. And Barbara Jones Hogu, I spent a lot of time with her. She was an educator. And uh, I would call on her a lot because uh, going in, these, these images were getting me really excited, like made me want to do something. Like the philosophy that she created was literally a set of directions on how to make artwork that does, that doesn't just sit on a wall, but does something, invigorates, excites people. I love that. And it's something I would come back to a lot, right? So here we have Jasper Johns, right? Completely different. But when you start looking at Jasper Johns, you start looking at my work. So there's these conversations. There's a space in between. Barbara Jones Hogu's, Afro Cobra. Jasper Johns, particle board, abstract painting. Unite, right? Five four by eight sheets, standard. Start to, any, any builder, contractor can come in and see. It's going to say something to them. Any person that's familiar with the history of painting, abstract painting, is going to say something to them. Anyone who's ever been evicted from their home is going to, it's going to say something to them. And then we put Unite on the back. Right? Lots of things happen when you restrict view and sight line. It's a massive piece, but you can never quite get the full picture. Because oftentimes, you know, once again, history of painting, Black painting, disinvestment, blank billboards, unite, united, victor. Right? Rothko. Yeah, you start to think about words, protest, where they land, how far they go. You know, is it a shirt? Is it found in a museum? Who benefits from protest? Who benefits from marketing? Right? So yeah, it's just pushing. And this is a little bit of my talk thinking of all those things but also a little bit of my suspicion and a little bit of a challenge at the same time, right? Thank you. So were there any questions? I know I talk a lot. I generally like doing like the, yes. Leading through, yes. Hey, what do you use to uh, uh, adhere your wood that the glue doesn't bleed through the Kool-Aid color? Yeah, um, 
I brought into the, the gallery, when you leave here, there's a couple samples of the earlier works, which it's, it's interesting. You start out trying to create really clean lines, like perfect, like those Afro-Cobra images where they kind of, and then at the end, you're like, man, I kind of like it when they bleed into each other. And then you spend the rest of the half trying to go back to the thing you accidentally did. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, I produced my own version of a stain from Kool-Aid. Uh huh. And um, some are water. Glue? What glue do you the use? glue is actually when you're working that big and you're a broke down artist, uh, you don't have the capacity to use a lot of wood glue. Okay. So I have to actually buy a special resin uh, that's inexpensive and cheap um, called plastic wood. Oh. And then um, it's highly toxic and dangerous, um, <laughs> which is usually how cheap things work. Um, so uh, there, in the catalog, there's an image of me sitting in the studio working where I have a full suit on. Uh, I wear a, 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 a respirator. Uh, I have all the people working in my studio wearing respirators. Um, so yeah, it, it just like, um, you know, there's a rumor that uh, Barbara Jones Hogu got really sick from using the inks and dyes and the silk screening, because I'm not really familiar with that process, and she stopped doing it for a while because she thought her son was getting sick. Um, and, and there was a rumor that she actually started playing around with Kool-Aid. It's not true, uh, apparently, but I heard that, like folklore. And I was just always really intrigued about that. So um, just really kind of exploring um, and, and, and stepping into the unknown. It was very frustrating, actually. I wanted to quit uh, often. And the Kool-Aid doesn't attract insects? No, not at all. There's no sugar in it. Oh, oh OK, the sugar-free Kool-Aid. No, it's just. Well, is, is Kool-Aid sugar, or is no. it like? It is. Well, I don't put extra sugar in it. It's just the, it's just the you know, the concentrated Kool-Aid. No, it's, um, yeah. Um, so I use like a dye, and then I mix it in. And in each, each one of those, so, so going back, the, the, the pieces, uh, I, I don't know anything about painting, but I know about building material. So I built a painting. I didn't paint a painting. Each one of those things are cut up, found lumber from the neighborhood out of a dumpster, or found, cut up into thin strips. Think like Arby's roast beef sandwiches, you know, just like, <laughs> like this. Cut down, stained individually, put back together, compressed from there to there, and then assembled. So it's a very tedious, long process that when I was doing research, everyone thought I was crazy. They're like, that's the dumbest thing in the world. Why don't you just go buy the board? And like, yeah. I don't want to buy the board. I want to make the board. I mean, so, yeah. If anyone else has other questions, just raise your hand because we want to use this so they can get us on the, the student broadcast. We're going to be on MTV, y'all. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. He's like, really? No. I'm joking. I just have a question as to the uh, where will you art end up? Mm -hmm. Will these be installed in some like a corporate yeah. uh, facility? Or Hopefully in everyone's homes. <laughs> well, some of them are a little big for most people's homes. <laughs> You're right. That's my problem. I mean, yeah. The gallery always like, you make stuff too big. Um, but there's some small ones. Um, ultimately, uh, some of those are museum pieces. You know, um, the, the larger ones will break down to become other things uh, or smaller pieces. Um, but the one will go in storage until it goes into the, a museum or um, conversations. Maybe it'll be at an Expo Chicago next year. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, those are, those are things to consider. I do have that impulse of making big things. You saw that big red thing. I don't know if I told you, there was a tree growing out of that thing, too. So it was even bigger than it looked. Um, well, it wasn't growing. It was dead in the top. Um, the groundskeepers had bets going that it wasn't going to live. But um, yeah, this impulse of making big, right? And, and, and I, you know, I try to think about how to make big small. But sometimes it is about the challenge of making big. And this was an opportunity to do something big. I don't really know where it's going to necessarily go, but I didn't want that to get in the way of, of not doing it. And um, there are consequences to that. You got to think about storage. Think, you got to constantly think about where it's going to go afterwards. But um, lately, I've just been like, just do it. You know, like, don't have a reason not to do it. So with this show, there's a lot of reasons not to do this process. Uh, not to kind of go through with this, but uh, I just kind of kept working. And, and eventually it made sense. It came out to be a wonderful show. Um, I was just 
I was wondering, um, Okay. So you said you liked um, welding, like um, artwork. Mm -hmm. Do you still do that as well as? Um, yeah, I made some of stated? the stands in the uh, in the show, which were integral part. They're actually part of the pieces. The stands aren't just stands; they're actually references to architecture and design. Um, uh, I actually have a welding studio. It's like you work your whole life to get the perfect welding studio. It's on wheels. It's in my garage. It opens up, goes into my yard, and then you stop welding. <laughs> um, and I'm getting back into welding. You have a tendency to things to come. There's a reason why it's in there. I am coming back to it and starting to think about how the earlier works. The essay, uh, Leanne's essay in the catalog, is really dense. It's really challenging. She talks about Rauschenberg like, for a long time before she actually talks about my work, um, which was wonderful because it starts to, even for me to push me to think a little more broadly. But uh, I am a welder at heart. I got a tour of the welding space today. Uh, by two people, which are wonderful. Uh, I'm a metalhead. So usually I walk around with burn holes in my clothes. These days I don't weld as much. But I do, I, I bring my friends in to weld. So I am around welders a lot. Um, and I will get back to it. You never lose that. Um, I still have a passion for the fire. But I left that m medium when I went to grad school because I was very comfortable in it. And I didn't want the medium, or the materials, to dictate the content, right? This content with board ups makes sense as wood. They don't make sense as metal. So I use wood, right? If I need to use photography, then I'm gonna go and figure out a way to do photography. The ideas run through all the work, not the medium, for me. The content is important, and then what makes sense material-wise, what I have access to, makes sense second. So in the beginning, I was like, I'm a metal person, I'm gonna make a metal man. And then I started to think, well, I want to talk about the Southside Community Arts Center. The best material is to actually get access to the collection. Get it? Um, where would you have, okay, I'm just talking loud. Um, where do you think you may have found your community if you weren't introduced to a community that already had a historical yeah. art yeah. community? Um, I would have found one. Um, it's a little bit of how I was raised. I was raised uh, from a politician. Um, and I didn't want to be a politician. God. So now I have to politic to get a floating museum down the river through my art. And my dad's like, man, that's amazing. You talk to the mayor? So then I become a politician with the art. My mother was a social worker. Didn't want to be a social worker. God, no, I want to be an artist. So then I started running an arts nonprofit, thinking about access to education for youth. So then I have to kind of turn into adjunct, like a social worker, right? So kind of in these two communities, or these two spaces by my parents also, uh, I was always volunteering, uh, teaching a soccer team. It was just a, something that was either um, nurtured in me or my nature. So I would have found a community. And now I don't just have the Southside Community Arts Center. There's like, I could talk about literally maybe 20 other spaces that I'm really invested in. But I just say that once again, I said it earlier. Guys, when you graduate, you're gonna get that amazing art degree, you're going to your next four year college or whatever, uh, especially for the artists. And you can get that arts degree, it's gonna be everything you wanted. And you're gonna get, you're gonna walk off that stage, you're gonna have that degree, and you're gonna get off that stage, and you're gonna be like, oh, now what? I have an art degree. I'm gonna go be an artist. Doesn't pay that great. So, so in those times when you don't know what you're doing and you have the impulse to sit on your butt and watch TV or whatever, just get up and go help somebody. Don't think too much about it. Find a place, volunteer, go to a church, go to an art center, go wherever, just help someone. And the thing is, I, I wasn't thinking this way, but everything I've given to that space and the others, I've gotten back like tenfold. Because people begin to see I'm reliable. They get to know me. I build networks. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do the Florida Museum without doing the Southside Community Art Center. So it doesn't necessarily make sense when you do it, but just give. Thank you. Welcome, Ajit. I really loved your pieces. Um, I was late to your, your lecture here today because I was Damn. spending a little more time in your gallery. Oh my God. Um, but I, there was one piece that really intrigued me. It was the, the Blue Cross 
and the Red X. Do you, is there a story behind that? What intrigued you? Um, what was the inspiration? Yeah, um, so I didn't talk about a lot of the work in the, in the show. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really fun piece. Um, once again, it, it references board ups because of the material that is used. And it sits a little high, so almost like a window, looking into a window. But it's about icons, icons in the areas where the wood comes from. And the X in my neighborhood can represent two things, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, the Nation of Islam is a space that's not that far away from my home, right? And the X is an idea, if you think about Malcolm X, that was very prevalent in the history of that area, right? Um, but then also thinking about what an X in a board up means. A uh, young lady caught it right away earlier, you know, being evicted from her home and thinking about demolition. So it, there's, the, the, you know, all of those X's, those crosses, and those things begin to reference things that impact that area, things that um, thinking about things that I'm seeing, things that impact people, whether it's healthcare or churches, right? Um, or, you know, yeah, so there's three X's are kind of having a dialogue about space, and then the structure itself is thinking about architecture, right, because it's kind of built a little high, like a, a window, or it, it makes you look up, so, yeah. Did you know that? You knew that, didn't you? Yeah, I thought you might know. Exactly. So it's like all this energy yep. right now is yep. coming. Yep. It's so it's, powerful. yeah, it's tapping in all these different, yeah. all at the same yeah. time. So yeah, it's a collage. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. No, thank you. Behind you. So I'm going to school to be a welder. I am, I Railhead. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I actually got burned yesterday welding. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I want to go be a welder for, a bit, cool. but I also am interested in doing the art side of it. Do you have any recommendations for that? Yeah, sure. Um, Lincoln Electric has a great workshop, two-week workshop if you can get in, um, that uh, exposes you to all types of training. I was very fortunate when I had my first studio. My studio mate was a guy named Charlie Yost. Charlie Yost was a retired, he became an artist, or he was an artist, but he was like the guy who trains the guys who trains the guys to weld, and he was my studio mate. So he hooked me up with all types of people, but um, just weld. That's pretty much what it is. And stretch yourself, learn the machines. Yeah, you want a you want a job welding. Yeah, that's a, that you can get a job welding and be able to make artwork. It's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's pretty much it. Just become a badass welder. <laughs> a few minutes if you want to come down ask him any questions he'll also be sticking around for a couple minutes in the gallery we'll probably mm -hmm. head over there if you want to check out the show and talk to him and thank you again for coming thank you. thanks sir.